Thank you. Um, OK, so I've been thinking with Thrawn about various aspects of secure quadratic voting. And the plan is that first I'll talk about securely implementing uh, quadratic voting and then, uh, and then talk a bit about refund rules, which we haven't gotten so much into uh, in these two days. So we'll start with the first one. And uh, the first question is, uh, well, if we're talking about security, then uh, what are we trying to protect against? So what could go wrong? Everything. <laughs> Good answer. Um, so yeah, uh, and, and we've seen things go wrong with voting. There are a lot of things that can go, go wrong with voting. And it can lead to uh, inconclusive results if uh, not administered well, or even if administered well at large scales. There are so many. Uh, moving parts in the system, um, technology can just fail us sometimes. Uh, and so the thing that we're trying to protect against is something like this. Um, we want to make sure that our election system has a uh, number of properties which we'll outline in a little bit. So the first one is secrecy. Um, and by this I mean something like a secret ballot, which has been recognized as useful for millennia or so. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about the reasons for that and the details of it uh, later. Um, second property that we want the system to have is verifiability. So we want to know that the election outcome is accurate and was uh, computed correctly and everything. So that actually usually breaks down into these three steps. Um, the voters should be able to check that their vote was cast as they intended it to be cast, uh, and then that it was collected as they cast it, uh, and finally that it was counted as it was collected. Um, so every step through the process. And in fact, uh, the individual voters should be able to check the first two things, and any observer should be able to check that the collected votes were counted uh, correctly. And finally, we want the system to be robust against false accusations, which means that if it was done correctly, then we don't want voters to be able to come out and say, no, it was done wrong, and provide any convincing evidence of that. So there is a literature on securely implementing voting, um, regular voting, not quadratic voting, um, proposing various systems, uh, achieving different trade-offs between the types of the, between the properties that I outlined and some others that could be desirable. Um, so then uh, the next thing is uh, what makes quadratic voting different? Um, can we just use one of those things that was on the previous slide? And the answer is the major difference is the fact that there are payments. Um, secure payments is actually a hard problem in itself. Secure voting is also hard to do, and we need to combine them. Um, also, the fact that uh, well, the, the fact that the voting system is different actually leads to slightly different requirements from the system than in regular voting. So, I will now go through these three desiderata, um, outlining what the regular property is, and then how we want to change it for QV. So, first, the secret ballot. Um, so usually uh, we want that uh, no voter can convince somebody else of the vote that they cast uh, beyond doubt. Um, and the first thing to observe here is that this is impossible. Sometimes when you announce the election outcome, uh, it's already known. Like if it's a unanimous vote, then you can actually tell how each individual in the population voted. So we need to add a caveat here which says uh, you can't convince anybody beyond what can be inferred from the election outcome already, which we consider inevitable. Um, and so there are a number of reasons for this. Um, it's important to avoid coercion, attacks, vote buying, bribery, and a uh, number of uh, issues that were actually discussed throughout uh, yesterday and today. Um, so for quadratic voting instead, uh, we want that uh, no voter can convince somebody else of the vote that they cast beyond what can be inferred from the election outcome already and the total revenue, which is another thing that is announced. And the vote that they cast here means uh, both the 
direction of the vote and the magnitude of the vote, how many votes they cast. In fact, we need something slightly stronger. Um, we need that the set of all vote sizes cast is also secret, even if it's not associated with people's individual identities. And the reason is that uh, if, if the set of vote sizes is known, if it's, say, announced on a public bulletin board, then that opens up opportunities for other types of attacks. For example, an attacker, could, a coercer, could say, uh, you must vote exactly $42.13 for candidate X, and then check that you do, at least, uh, he, he may not be able to check which candidate you voted for. He can check that the number is there, though, and that may incentivize people to, uh, to do as coerced. OK, so uh, that's secrecy. Next, verifiability. Um, and we went through this uh, earlier. So we want to each voter to be able to verify that their vote was cast as intended, collected as cast, and anybody to verify that the votes were counted as collected. Um, and so from publicly available information, any third party, maybe not even a voter, should be able to verify um, the election outcome. And for quadratic voting, um, again, we need to add some conditions about the money. So each voter should be able to verify that their refund is correct and uh, to be able to verify the total election revenue, which is announced. And finally, uh, robustness against false accusations. Uh, this is um, relatively simple. So if the election was conducted correctly, nobody can produce evidence otherwise. And for quadratic voting, if the payments and refunds were done correctly, then nobody can produce evidence that it was otherwise, additionally to the basic requirement, of course. So OK, uh, now I'm going to run through what steps would be involved in implementing a quadratic voting. Um, first, we want to check the identity of a voter, uh, make sure they're eligible. And then uh, the voter gets to create a vote. And in order to create a vote, they should have to pay the correct amount of money. Um, and then they can cast the vote. So after having written their choice on the piece of paper, they put it in a box. Um, and after all the voting is done, then uh, the election authorities have some way of tallying all the votes and of summing up all the payments. And then there's, uh, there should be some sort of audit step where the verifiability can be done, that people can check that things were done correctly, and if they weren't, then complain and announce publicly and so on. Um, and finally, uh, the reimbursements should be issued. Uh, OK, so yeah, we're considering two main types of settings. And each setting has its own sort of security requirements. Uh, so these are the ones we chose to focus on. The first is elections for, say, a presidential election, which is conducted physically at a polling site, um, where the eligibility to vote is tied to your real identity. Um, and uh, these are typically high stakes and have higher risk of attacks than the other category, which is, we're calling surveys, online surveys. So here uh, we're saying it's all conducted over the internet or a network. Um, the eligibility to vote might be tied to your email address or a virtual identity. Uh, and these are usually lower stakes with lower risk of attacks. And so there are different requirements here. And uh, I also want to say that uh, we don't believe that using existing technology, conducting really important presidential elections and so on uh, remotely on the internet uh, can be done securely. So. Um, that's another reason why the other one is not called survey. It's, uh, it's not called election, it's called survey. Um, OK, so uh, from the description here, it looks like um, the elections, rather than the surveys, should be uh, have stronger require security requirements, be harder to satisfy in most aspects. And that is mostly true. But an observation is that um, one thing that's easier in the physical polling site setting is that we can use actual money for payments. And uh, because we can use cash, and cash is basically anonymous, we assume that uh, if you have a $20 bill after the election, you don't know which, payer, uh, which voter paid it in. Um, assumption is maybe questionable, but we assume it. And uh, in the online case, we have to figure out some way of doing the payments, which is not cash, but is satisfies the anonymity properties that we need. 
So I'm going to address the election case first. And we can't use paper ballots. Um, and the reason is that if I write on my ballot that I am voting uh, 40 votes for a certain candidate, then that violates afterward when they're counting the votes, people will see the amounts that were voted. And we said that one of the secrecy requirements is that you can't know even the set of amounts that were voted. So, um, so OK, uh, even the basic physical system of paper ballots doesn't work. But we are going to suggest a different physical system, which is not using uh, complicated technology for now, uh, which would work better for QV. And it's going to be based on wax. And by wax, I mean like that stuff that candles are made out of. Um, and the basic idea is that we're going to represent one vote with one gram of wax. It's by mass of the wax. Um, OK, so I'm going to go through the steps of the implementation and see how it would work. Um, first, we have to do the, the identity check. So the voter walks into the polling place and uh, goes up to the poll worker, identifies herself with her passport or something, driver's license, um, and then gets a token from this person which says that she's authorized to vote. And this token is anonymous. It doesn't have any imp identifying information anymore. And so uh, the voter takes this token and goes to somebody else. This is a different person, has a different color tie. And so um, <laughs> they hand over the token. Um, and this person now doesn't know who the voter is, just that they're authorized to vote. Um, and some money to pay for the, her votes. And receives back the corresponding uh, quantity of wax. Um, and so next, uh, she has to cast her vote. So uh, there's some enclosed uh, voting area where it's curtained off and you can't see inside. So in the private voting area, you now have two containers for the binary choice. You have to choose a candidate and put your wax um, in one of the pots. And you can't see inside. They have lids and they have a little slot where you can insert your wax. Uh, the next step is that we have to tally the votes and that uh, we <laughs> <laughs> light up the pots. So now the wax um, all melts together and we have this uh, very useful physical property of wax which it means that uh, once you've me well, melted it together you can't tell anymore what was the sizes of the uh, individual chunks that went in. So that information is irrecoverably lost which is exactly what we wanted. Um, and then we should weigh these pots. Um, and see who won. Um, you do it if, if they see 10 one gram chunks, they can't tell whether it was 8 plus 2 or 6 plus 4. So if they get standard size chunks of wax. They, th probably practically speaking, um, there would be different size chunks of wax, like uh, uh, 1 gram, 5, 10, 20, something like because uh, because we would expect the variation in vote sizes, or we would want to allow for variation in vote sizes that would be sufficient that you wouldn't really want to give like a cart full of very small pieces of wax <laughs> to a rich voter, say. Someone might stand <laughs> real Right, um, and that would not be pri privacy preserving. Um, <laughs> so, OK, so another important thing about this step is that it should be broadcasted on national television. Uh, and then everyone can be sure that uh, the votes were counted as collected, which was another requirement that we wanted. Um, OK, and we need to sum the payments. And uh, we're going to go really low tech here and say that somebody counts them. Um, <laughs> and the entire population can watch as, as they count the money. Um, and finally, uh, reimbursements which would be in the form of checks. So once the total amount of the election revenue is known, then they can divide it by the total number of voters and make out a check to each voter and mail them out. And if you were really paying attention, you'll have noticed that I skipped from five, step five to step seven here. Um, and that's because in this physical example, we don't have an explicit audit step, and that's taken care of by the TV broadcasting of the entire procedure. Um, so uh, right. So let's see why, why the properties that we wanted are satisfied. Um, the verifiability and the robustness against false ac accusations of the scheme um, follows from the public monitoring and the fact that from the total election revenue, anybody can deduce the uh, individual refund amount. And uh, checks cannot be forged, which we just assume. Um, and 
secrecy uh, comes from the fact that once you melt them, the sizes of the wax chunks are uh, gone. And the wax containers are only opened after the melting. They should not be able to be opened before that. Um, and so only the total mass can be known. Um, and the containers and the lockbox for the money are secure. They, you can't see into them. And finally, cash is anonymous, which I mentioned before. Um, OK, so, so this system might not be that practical as some people were pointing out. Um, and so uh, we propose an alternative system which replaces the properties that we achieve through using wax in the scheme that I just outlined using cryptographic tools. And um, because of time constraints, I can't go into it in a lot of detail, but uh, the tools that we use, the first one is homomorphic encryption, which it's a special type of encryption which uh, we want to encrypt the votes so that you, you can have an encrypted vote and not know what the, what the value inside is. But we also want to be able to add them up um, and get the final count um, while they're, they're still encrypted. And homomorphic encryption gives you this property that you can take two encrypted things and uh, do something to them and get an encryption of the sum. And this allows us to tally the votes, all encrypted. And uh, also, in fact, we have the ability to multiply, which is re required for the quadratic voting squaring to make sure that uh, the, we add up the payment amounts correctly. Um, and we also use digital signatures, which are basically like uh, normal handwritten signatures, except they have cryptographic security guarantees um, and uh, zero knowledge proofs, um, which so these are all uh, very. I do want to hear about zero knowledge proofs. <laughs> um, OK, so well. <laughs> So that, that gives me permission to go a bit over time, right? Uh, and well, uh, so th if I want to prove a statement to you, um, but I don't want to give you any auxiliary information about the statement, only the fact that it's true, then it turns out it's possible to do that um, using cryptography. So for example, if I want to uh, tell you that there's this big number and it's the product of two primes, and I know the primes, then I could prove it to you by telling you the primes, but then you would know the primes, right? And I only want to, you to know that it is the product of two primes, and I could show you if I wanted to, but <laughs> I don't want to actually show you. Um, and so it's, it's like minimizing the information leaked while you do a proof. Um, surveys. Uh, we have virtual identities, but we have to deal with this online payment issue. And so some of the issues that um, arise here can be addressed in pretty much the same way that we've addressed it in the polling site setting. So uh, we can use sort of existing proposals for remote voting systems um, and uh, adapt them for QV using homomorphic encryption, digital signatures, and zero knowledge proofs um, in a very similar way to, with, to what we did before. Um, but we need to also integrate some anonymous online payment system. Uh, why does it have to be anonymous? Well, otherwise uh, the payment amounts are known. That means the the vote amounts are known, and that's bad. So um, the first observation is that credit cards, debit cards, bank transfers, um, these traditional methods are all no good uh, because your bank knows exactly how much you paid. Um, and, uh, and also cryptocurrencies, um, at least Bitcoin, is not appropriate. And uh, that is because of this um, design feature of Bitcoin. Essentially, they have a public ledger where there is a history of all the transactions that ever happened in Bitcoin just posted in a public place. And that means that all the amounts would be known if you used Bitcoin for this. Um, so there is... Um, uh, sort of building upon Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency proposal called Zero Cash, which is explicitly designed to have strong anonymity properties in that you can't tell who initiated the transfer, who received the transfer, or what the amount was. Um, so uh, at least from the public records um, and uh, integrating that with the adapted version of the remote voting system. <laughs> It was invented by some people at MIT and Johns Hopkins. <laughs> um, so, um, OK, and that's what I'm going to say about securely implementing quadratic voting for now. We can get back to it um, afterward. Um, and I want to say a few thoughts we had about refund rules. 
now. Um, so, so the original quadratic voting proposal is considering, and everything we talked about so far is considering the case where everybody pays into a pod and then gets equally refunded back from it. Um, and and the uh, Lely and Wells paper doesn't uh, discuss in a lot of detail the refund rule, but um, it does does comment that uh, many other refund rules would work as well. And so we can ask what makes a robust refund rule, both in terms of the original analysis and in terms of security properties that we might mine. Um, and are there interesting variants that we could consider? So um, for the purpose of this, we only consider linear refund rules. And that means that we're representing the refund rule by this matrix. Um, the rows and columns can be thought of as people in a five-person population here. Um, and each entry is between zero and one, and it corresponds to the fraction of the amount paid in by the column uh, voter, uh, which is received by the row voter. Um, so for, for a refund rule represented in this way, uh, we can take the vector of the amounts that were paid in by all the voters, multiply it with the matrix, and get out the refund amounts due to each of the voters. Um, and the QV analysis requires two properties from such a rule. The first one is budget balance. The total money in should be equal to the total money out. And also efficiency, which means that the diagonal entries of the matrix should be all, all the same and less than one. Um, so, uh, so now I'm just going to suggest a few rules which satisfy these properties. Um, the first one is the neighbor rule. Um, and this is just you swap your payment with your neighbor in line. Um, and this satisfies budget balance and efficiency. Um, but it does seem undesirable from a security standpoint for a couple of reasons. First of all, everybody will try to queue up behind the rich people. And um, second, there's uh, even more possibility for collusion than, uh, than we were already discussing, which is basically that if you're next to somebody who's voting for the same candidate, then you can safely vote arbitrarily large amounts because you know that you're only going to swap money anyway. Um, so, so there seem to be some other requirements that we want to capture from a security standpoint for a refund rule. OK, um, and then here's another one. This is the lottery, which means that a random winner gets all of the refund. Um, and uh, this is randomized, right? So uh, actually, this is a variant. Uh, the original um, work was only considering deterministic refund rules. But um, assuming that, uh, Assuming that the voters are, are risk neutral, which the analysis does, then, um, then as long as budget balance holds and efficiency holds on expectation, then this should work out. Um, and uh, so this could have some advantages, like it could significantly reduce the administrative <laughs> cost because you only have to issue one refund. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and then it might increase voter turnout if people get excited about this kind of thing. <laughs> so uh, something to check experimentally, maybe. Um, OK, so one more. Uh, random swaps. So here, we're, instead of swapping with your neighbor in line, you're going to swap with a random partner. That's, so you swap with a random person here. And again, it's budget balanced, and it's efficient in expectation. Um, and uh, this could have an, a different sort of advantage, which is that it could reduce the trust that you have to place in the election authorities. Because if you're swapping with random partners, then you can pay directly between members of the voting population instead of trusting the, the central authority to handle the money uh, correctly. Yeah, and so, so on, on the refund rule side, I've, I've just sort of said a bunch of different rules that you could consider, but what's the point? And the point is that, well, in, in our write-up, we write down um, certain types of attacks that can be conducted based on refund rules, like um, queuing up behind the rich people and so on, um, things that we want to protect against and properties that the refund rule should have um, to be robust. Um, and also, we have this new idea of randomizing the refund rules. Um, and uh, make corresponding definition. Um, and then going back to the earlier part, um, we have this outline implementation of QV, which is based on WAX. And then another one for the same scenario, which is based on cryptography. 
Um, and we have an outline implementation for online surveys, which I didn't get to go into much, but that's based on uh, similar cryptography and also anonymous cache system. So the, one of your problems is the, is the payment system, and, and that, notice that that, that that doesn't, that's not a problem for the, the credits. So everybody can have the credits, you can do everything with cryptography, no actual money is changing hands. And so that, that part's a lot easier. Yes. If you give everyone 10 um, shifts. Exactly. Kind of right. So I am. Um, yeah. I we were we were considering the real money setting. Um, there are definitely advantages. You can basically design some sort of anonymous transfer system, right? Just for your chips. Um, you. Uh, there are also other uh, security considerations that arise. Actually, if if you're using fake money as well, like for example, um, the part of the reason that we want all this secrecy requirements is so is so that you can't do vote buying and so on. In the sense that if if I uh, tell you to vote for somebody, then I can't be sure you did it. So um, it's a risk to me to do that sort of thing. Um, if we literally had chips, for example, then I could buy chips from you and take them from you. And then, um, and then I would be sure that I had control of those uh, th those chips. And so we would want some sort of additional properties from the chip system, which ties. Uh, it's totally clear to me, because, because with, the, with the system where you're using the chips, that's equivalent to the normalized gradient addition. So you just everybody everybody reports a direction that they want to go and then and then you add them up and and it seems like it's pretty pretty straightforward for the cryptography. You're not allowed to exchange these. You you can have your own personal budget. You're not allowed to exchange these. Uh yes, I mean I'm I'm basically agree I I, I think we're not disagreeing. I'm just saying, like the 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 crypto system that one would build to implement the chips would have to have like these properties that make sure that they're non-transferable and so on. So. So is the reason that we need the wax rather than just you give me a bunch of coins and I drop them in the pot because of the continuous? Um, well, if you had a really hot fire, then you could me melt all the coins together as no, well. No, no, but why do we need to melt anything? So suppose that we just had. Uh, that's just what I'm missing. So. If so, I just had a bunch of coins, I t everybody throws their coins in, you know, and then we can't tell what the bundle is. So if it's one coin per vote, and one vote is the smallest amount yeah. that you can vote instead of 25 millionths of a vote, um, then, then that would work, and uh, there would potentially be practicality considerations, because, like, you would probably, so, I mean, Money being discrete in real life, you might want to make one coin equal to one cent. And then if you did that and somebody wanted to vote some significant number of dollars, um, then you would have this problem of having to give them a card. Um, but yeah. So my, my, my second question was, was different. I didn't understand. Except, so suppose I want to verify the election. I didn't quite understand what I have to, that the election was done correctly. Is it just the fact that it was broadcast, or I don't So in the wax that. case, yes. In the wax case, the um, uh, the verifiability is is not particularly um, detailed. But I can talk a bit more about the crypto-based system, which uh, uh, and uh, which has a more. Uh, well, whatever you think is, I mean, the, I guess what I didn't understand out of the toy model. I mean, I guess the important thing is what you're really going to do rather than the toy model. But what I didn't even understand out of the toy model is. You know, if I take that model literally, there's a lot of pro seems to be a lot of problems yeah, there with it in terms of are. I mean, there are also verified like that. How do you hide that? That you can't see the voter, but you know that. Right. So I mean, that's uh, that's an, like the way that we've actually written up the wax example is is more detailed than I've presented it here. Um, and there are other properties that you would want. For example, you would not want people to like walk into the polling place with their own wax in their pocket, right? Um, and and so on. So so these are this is a simplified version of a simple toy example. <laughs> Um, I think I th so in in the wax example I don't think there's a lot that's that meaningful to say for, for that um, but I can talk about how it works in the crypto case um, okay so uh, <laughs> would, it, would it be fair to say that getting hung up on the, on the reasonability of nothing the wax is, is really missing the point because <laughs> the purpose of having the melting wax stage is not because I'm actually going to do a wax thing. It's to get people prepared for the idea of decrypting. Um, 
it's it's partly about the yeah you could say it's about the idea of decrypting it's also about the idea of losing the information about the individual vote amounts but having the aggregate information only yeah so okay so i'll talk about the crypto system okay so we're still in the physical polling site setting so it's still going to be the case that there are people involved in the process you have to actually identify yourself using your uh, real identity um, and you get an anonymous token so uh, this wouldn't have to be the, the, like a physical token anymore um, there's uh, this things called anonymous credentials, which, uh, which probably you can um, uh, prove possession of them without revealing anything about your identity. That would be slightly better because maybe, maybe the, uh, this guy and the guy at the next table can collude and mark the tokens or something. So um, uh, we use that. Uh, okay. And then we hand over the token and we hand over the money and the money is still cash here. So that's fine. And um, so here, in this step, it, might, it would probably not be a person anymore, um, but you have a voting machine. And at the voting machine, you can enter your preferences, like you do on voting machines that exist. Um, but it's also kind of like an ATM. It has a place where you can put in money, and it can count the money, and so on. Um, and, uh, and so you need to pay the correct amount. And what it will give to you is an encryption of your vote. So th these machines are. Um, so, so it will print you an encryption of your vote, um, and you should go and put that in the ballot box when you actually want to vote. It will also give you uh, a receipt which has the encryption of your vote on it, and this is for the verifiability step, um, which is looking at that receipt, you can't tell how I voted. So this is not bad for coercion and so on, but I want to be able to take it home and later check on the public bulletin board that my vote is there because that means that it will be counted. Um, and so all of the encrypted votes are actually going to be published on a public bulletin board. Um, and, and finally, there's this consideration. You need to identify it, so it wouldn't be the amount, but it would be, I was just assigned a random number. Yes, or even they could have your name. Like if, if we're saying it's sort of considered OK that you know who turned out, and that would be the only information that's revealed, even if you have actual names there. Um, how do I know that my vote Right. So, um, so maybe the machine is cheating, right? Um, so what you do is um, essentially uh, one thing that I could do is uh, when I'm suspicious, I ask the machine, okay, show me that you did it correctly, right? And and then it has to decrypt it for me and show me that it did it correctly, right? Um, now this is problematic because now I have the decryption, and so I can go and take it and show it to a coarser, right? Um, and and prove that I voted in a particular way. So if I ask the machine this question, then I can no longer use that encrypted vote. But at least I know that it was encrypted correctly, that the machine was working correctly for that encrypted vote, which I can no longer cast. Um, and basically, it's a probabilistic argument saying that so the voter should have the option to challenge a vote. And if it is challenged, then the, vote, the machine will decrypt it. It can do it however many times uh, they want. And this means that uh, the probability that the machine could be cheating and not caught is very low, especially over the entire population. So, right, I mean, we're talking about like different steps of the process here. Remember, we broke down verifiability into three things. So the fact that you can challenge the encryption that the machine just made, this is uh, cast as intended, right? We're checking the, and, and uh, okay, so, so we're saying, but probabilistically, we can be very sure that the vote that, so after, after I burn my vote, I have to get a new one, right? I have to get the machine to do it again because I want to actually cast my vote and I can't do the one that was opened. Mm -hmm. So eventually I end up with one which I don't challenge, but probabilistically I'm very sure that it's correct, right? Um, and I'm sure because when I put the thing in, no, it's that big. So, no, but it, so it gave me something, and when it spits me back, yes, it's correct. The thing I thought. It oh, but the, yes, the it's correct. The thing spitting is, it back is the same program. No, no, no but the, 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 it's a proof. It's like, a, so, I mean, the encryption is, is, a, is a number, right, essentially. No, but there's sort of a meta question here. I'm trusting that the thing I'm putting it's, it's in not is that, giving it back. So it's, it's, it's actually reading the thing I've put in. Uh, no, so you can you can basically so it's going to like it's going to print out a piece of paper. So first of all, it gave you the piece of paper with the encryption on it. Next, it's going to print out a piece of paper which has the proof that it was decrypted correctly, right? Uh, and basically, you can take that away and check it yourself in your own time using a different machine. And uh, but it's it's proof. 
no, you can use it, use any machine. The point is that the, the encryption scheme which is used is publicly known, right? It's going to be like RSA or something, like it, 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 everybody knows um, what is the encryption procedure being done, right? And so afterward, I can always check that uh, it was indeed the case that the proof that was correct. Like maybe I can't do it there on the spot because I can't read this like giant piece of paper with lots of numbers on it, but at least I can, uh, and, and compute in my head, but I can definitely get it checked. So that you can Sorry? go to the vote buyer. If, it, if I could use a different machine to verify that things were done correctly, then wouldn't so you can use any machine is the point. Like you can use your home computer, you can use your phone, uh, you can use anything. But how do you keep somebody from designing a machine that will let that will not only decrypt it and see if it did a good job, but also verify what you voted? Because if you wanted to, her to teach you, like, you know, first year crypt graduate cryptography, like, here today, like, I, I think that's fine. But, like, you have to understand that, like, like her co-author, like, invented things that, like, literally won the Turing Award for precisely answering questions that you're asking right now. So you can either take it on faith or you can have her, like, go to a whiteboard and, like, explain to you, like, all the details of how this works. So, I mean, there, there is, the, the main point, I guess, is that there, there is not actually a trust assumption because this is a thing that any computer can check. Um, and so uh, even if you can't do it on the spot, you can definitely check independently. Yeah, isn't this um, very strongly analogous to the problem providing zero knowledge proofs that I've colored graph correctly, where they randomly select nodes and... Yes, it's exactly, yes. I mean, uh, yeah, it's cut and choose. It's exactly one of these zero knowledge yeah. techniques, yeah. And, but, and, so, and it rests on the fact that I can sample many nodes from the graph, and they're all in each one, happens to be correct. I could take one, but the odds of taking right. all of them are negligible. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, next step. <laughs> um, right, uh, well, OK, so actually, yeah, we, we've done cast as intended. And then we want to say collect it as cast. And we can do that because everybody takes home their receipt of the vote that they actually cast. And then they can check that it's on the bulletin board, which is, could be like a website or something. Um, OK, and finally, and if it is not there, they can actually say, look, I have this receipt, and it's not there. And this is sort of one directional. So if the bulletin board has a lot of votes, some of them that are huge, that nobody casts, the way you would show that that's not supposed to be there, someone just threw in a 1,000 votes for Trump? Uh, yeah, yeah, so that is uh, an advantage of listing voter names. Um, on, on there because then you have to actually make up a thousand people, which if you are an attacker, there is a number of ways you could do this, right? Like you could try to just literally make up fake people or you could try to pretend that some people who are unlikely to vote uh, voted and, and th then if you know that your elderly neighbor did not actually go out and vote yesterday and their name is on the bulletin board, then you can call it out. So let me let me finish the describing the procedure of how it's done. All right. So um, so what I said everybody can compute is an encryption of the outcome, not the outcome itself, just an encryption of the outcome. Right. So now uh, now we need to decrypt it. But obviously it's not okay that anybody can decrypt that um, because then anybody could decrypt any of the votes exactly like you were saying. So uh, the decryption is done using a secret key, right? Um, which uh, we're going to distribute among a number of election trustees. Um, and the hope is, that, and, and they have to all get together in order to actually do the decryption. And we hope that not all of them are going to be corrupt and collude. They should be people who the public generally trusts. Um, so they, they and that's uh, possible through a technique called secret sharing. Um, they, uh, none of them individually know the secret key, but when they get together, they can uh, know it and decrypt. And they provide a proof that they decrypted correctly. So what's important here is that they provide a proof that they decrypted the correct encryption correctly, because the correct encryption is something that everybody knows. And so then you see that this encryption actually corresponds to this total outcome. And they announce that on TV or something. Um, and so that, that's how the outcome is known. And a similar procedure needs to be done with the payments. So our homomorphic encryption scheme not only allows for adding, but also for squaring. Um, so we have the list of encryptions of all the votes. And now we're going to compute the list of encryptions of all the squares of the votes. And then we're going to add all of those up. And so we get the sum of the squares. Again, the encryption of the sum of the squares is something that anybody can know. And then the trustees get together, give a proof that they decrypted correctly. Now, 
if this uh, situation that you described happened, where some people got a large number of free votes, then this will be de detected because when they count the actual amount of cash which came in, which should still be in this secure lockbox, then it will be much less than uh, the total sum of money expected, which was computed using the encryption. And then they can't figure out what exactly happened, but they know that something went wrong, yeah, which is... Uh, <laughs> What's the, in terms of having these multiple, what's the role of the number of, why do we want multiple people or does it matter how many we have logically exactly? Um, so it's like we don't want to trust a single person with this huge amount of power because if we did that then they could just go and decrypt everything at home in principle. Um, so uh, we want to, I mean in some sense it's also like a yeah, we're, we're trying to reduce the possibility that this power is abused by distributing it am among many people. How many people exactly is up to the <laughs> That's fine by me. <laughs> um, okay, so, so I think we covered verifiability pretty thoroughly. Um, yeah, and, and uh, right, so, so what do you do once you finish this procedure at the machine? You end up with your receipt, which you take home, and you also end up with a paper piece which has the encryption on it, which goes into a ballot box. You have to put the paper piece into the ballot box in order for your vote to be valid. Um, but uh, but probably it won't actually be using the, the paper pieces primarily. It'll be recorded digitally on the computer and added up digitally on the computer and everything, but it's a paper trail which is possible to check against um, in case anything goes wrong. Um, and then you leave. You put your box, uh, thing in the box and then you take your receipt and you leave. Um, and then we need to do the adding, which I already described, and the adding of the payments, which I already described. Um, Right, and the reimbursements work the same as before once you've verified the total amount. There's a question of what you do if the audit doesn't go perfectly, which needs to be figured out and probably depends on the exact situation, so it's outside the scope of what we suggest. Um, I guess we're worried if there's too much money as well as if there's too much money. So, uh, it's actually, the, the condition that we want to check is that the encrypted expected amount of money is bigger uh, than the, the, no, it is smaller than the actual amount of money received. And the reason for that is that there is this problem which is known as the fleeing voter problem, um, which means that people may just like do all the procedure at the machine and then invalidate their vote by leaving. Um, without casting their vote, in which case the money will have gone in, the cash will be there, um, and we will be expecting a smaller amount of money because they didn't cast their vote. So in, in one direction it's okay and possibly expected, apparently it actually happens a lot, um, that I don't know, they get a phone call that their you house is on fire and then they have to the leave. You don't really optimize across the, the Ziderata, you, you sort of treat each of them as a hard kind of a hard constraint is that because I just instinctively I would think there'd be trade-offs between them. Um yeah if if uh so I mean, it, it's also, yeah, there, there's definitely a trade-off, especially in, in the sense that it, it, something which should be clear from the descriptions of the requirements are, are that secrecy and verifiability are pretty much opposing requirements. Um, and uh, that's part of why it's a hard problem. Um, so, uh, and, and essentially, like, existing systems do trade them off to some extent. Um, because the best possible system for for verifiability, for example, would just be to make everything public and, and that's just not acceptable for the other requirements. But that would be better than, than this, for example, because it would be more transparent, more verifiable. Um, and it, it really depends also on the requirements of the particular setting, like the online surveys or the, the uh, presidential election. Um, and, and even like these other settings that we've talking about, we've been talking about like uh, corp corporate decisions or, or um, patents or the, the, all of these would have sort of slightly different security requirements, I think, so. Well, I, I was just gonna add, I mean, this is why one of the fundamental principles of cryptography is that all the algorithms are completely public and all the security resides in the key. And you can verify everything about it, except the key, right? Which is yeah. why we can, you know, homomorphic uh, encryption. We can do everything and verify all those algorithms, 
but you can't decrypt it because you don't know the key. Right? But you can do all the algorithms because they're open, they're public. There are no secret algorithms. So a setting where something like that could be a concern in, in the system that I described um, is, for example, if, uh, if the machine somehow knows uh, which voters are um, unlikely to challenge their votes. And if the machine knows that and messes with the votes of the people who are not going to challenge their votes, then potentially this could have some effect. Um, and, and, uh, so this is the if you can find tournaments idea. Sorry? This is the if, if you can find hermits. Um, it's, it's related to the hermits idea, yeah. And, and, and so, I mean, it, it's inherent to any system which depends on auditing by voters that uh, the voters have to do audits. Yes. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. But I mean, that's why it's exactly like the graph coloring problem. Mm -hmm. is because the reason why that's secure is because you actually do check them. And believe me, as soon as these things go online, there are checkers whose codes are, whose algorithms are going to go through everything, checking them all. Right? And so they'll find the hermits with extremely high probability.